I wanted to, I wanted to dive into our passage today. And it's kind of a weird thing for me because we're going to be looking at a passage that when we read it at first glance, we're going to go, oh, this is the point of the message, right? We're going to study this particular parable that Jesus is teaching, but we're not. And, and so, I know, I know, big letdown, I'm sorry, but, but, I, but we're, we're not going to look at it necessarily like dissect it, although we should do that on our own. I, I, want, to, I want to focus on the words that Jesus says immediately following that. And I think sometimes we can just over, overlook things. I mean, I'm guilty of that, but I, I want to just set you up. It will, it'll be in Matthew chapter 13. So I, I titled this message, Which Way is Up? I remember reading a Dallas Willard book called The Divine Conspiracy. And if you have never read it, that's okay. But I, I, when I was in seminary, I, I, I had the opportunity to read through this massive book uh, for me. And, you know, what I remember most about it is how it profoundly confused me. And, uh, and I realized, I remember thinking, I don't belong here. I, I, don't, I don't belong here. I don't know what's, what he's saying. I can't read this. Uh, but, but, but I do remember one particular analogy uh, from this book that, uh, th- and he talks about this pilot flying upside down. It's very early on in the first chapter, and it kind of reads like this. It says, recently, a pilot was practicing high-speed maneuvers in a jet fighter. She turned the controls for what she thought was a steep ascent and flew straight into the ground. She was unaware that she had been flying upside down. He says, this is a parable of human existence in our times. Not exactly that everyone is crashing, although there is enough of that. But most of us, as individuals and world society as a whole, live at high speed. And often with no clue to whether we're flying upside down or right side up. Indeed, we are haunted by a strong suspicion that there may may be no difference. Or at least that it is unknown or irrelevant. So if you're like me and you read that, I had to read that like 50 times. Uh, but again, but what Willard is describing here, and I'll kind of break it down for you. He's describing this pilot doing like maverick style moves. You know, you've seen Top Gun? Okay, so, you know, she proceeds to turn the controls for a steep climb and ends up crashing into the ground. And he said she had been unaware that she was upside down. So if you think of yourself upside down and you go for a steep ascent, that's straight down. He's basically saying this illustration describes many of us and even our culture, that we are the pilot flying upside down and we don't even know it. And some of us might be headed in the wrong direction because we think we know what's best, but in fact, we're disoriented. We're not calibrated. We're not flying right side up. But in fact, one move away from our own crash. Welcome to church, Ah, everyone. uh, Today's message is not about your impending crash, okay? I just want to just put that out there. But, But it's really about your direction. Where am I headed? Where are you headed? Where are we headed? Which way is up? As many of you know, I, I just returned from sabbatical, and for those who don't know what sabbatical is, it's just an extended time away from work to find rest and renewal. And I have probably been asked about a thousand and one times, how was your sabbatical? Uh, and my typical response has been, good. But that's not usually enough for people. Like, they, they, they want more. Like that's not, I, that I need to sort of explain what good means. And I, 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 talk about, uh, I talk about the rest that I got. I talk about the time I was able to spend with God, just me and him. I, was, I talk about some of the things that I was able to do with my family. And, but, but to be completely transparent with all of you today, my time away was really good. But it was also really difficult, mostly because I've never done something like this before. Uh, 
Also because I had to wrestle with some things that I didn't feel like wrestling with. And also because I had an opportunity to get some perspective. To maybe consider that it's me that's flying upside down. As I was preparing for an, an extended time away, I, I came across some notes from an author and pastor, Rich Biotis, and, uh, he's, which he's one of my favorites, but he talks a lot about sabbatical, having been on a couple of them. And he says this, and it kind of wrote, I wrote it down for my own notes, and you, know, you can take it if you want, but he says, why sabbatical? Number one, and this is for him, to enter into what Newman called a time of creative withdrawal. Number two, to live out the truth that I am more than what I do. And number three, to listen for God's direction for the next season. So I, I thought, okay, creative withdrawal. To live in the truth that I'm more than what I do. <laughs> to, to listen for God's direction. And so when, when I was looking and thinking and pondering this, I was trying to dissect personally who I am mentally and emotionally and, and psychologically and spiritually. And obviously I can't do that physically. But, but these, th- these three ideas, what I realized for me personally was antithetical to the way that I think. Creative withdrawal, like I like creating like, I don't want to withdraw from that. I like doing new things. I, I love being around people. I, I love to collaborate and to talk, take someone's ideas and to maximize them. I, I love playing music and I love teaching. Withdraw? Or even the concept of living in the truth that I'm more than what I do? Like, what are we if at some level we're not defined by what we do except that, except that I'm, I'm more than the things that I do? How? Listen for God's direction? Like, I know God's direction. Like, I read his word. I pray. Plus, I'm pretty sure his way is the way that I would do it anyway. But, like, I <laughs> wait and listen for God's direction like that. See, I think most of us, if you're like me, I mean, I I'm guess I'm generalizing here. Most of us want to grow. We want to grow educationally. We want to grow emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And most of us, if you have kids or if you know some kids, you want them to grow in that way too. We want them to develop. We want them to mature. Most of your parents wanted that for you too. But if, if we want that, and it seems like everyone else wanted that for us too at some point in our life, why are we so opposed to change? Change. You know, change is a funny thing because I some of us are pretty adamant about how we're open to change. Oh, I'm flexible. I'm totally open. Yeah, whatever you want to do. But we're totally resisting or resistant to changing ourselves. Like there are others in this room who would flip a table if they changed the menu at your favorite restaurant. What do you mean they don't have any more nachos? <laughs> and I, I want you to take quick inventory of this. So let's just look at the past year for you. Okay, and I know it's difficult because it's like lots of things have happened already, right? It's only been, it's been eight, nine months, almost nine months now. If you look at the past year, let me ask you this question. Where has been the place you've grown the most? My guess is that's where the most change has occurred. In order to grow, we must change. And it's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. Could you imagine if, if a child, when they're learning to crawl, you know, and they finally flip over and they're on the four, all fours and they're learning to crawl, and it's like, okay, here they go, here they go. Oh, they're moving, they're moving, look at them go. And, and we've celebrated that, yay. All right, well, now you can get yourself to school. Okay, because you, just because they can crawl, because they can move forward, like, yeah, go ahead, now you can just go and take care of yourself. No, no, we, we, we expect them to walk one day. We expect them to hopefully run someday. We don't settle for just the crawl. We want her to change and grow and develop and mature. But unfortunately, at some point in our life, we've, we've come to accept a crawl. We're good with where we are. We don't need to change anymore. We move around just fine. Well, maybe, maybe we need to consider, like I needed to consider, that I've gotten used to my ways, my patterns, my rhythms, of life that, that so much that I, I don't want to consider that maybe, maybe I'm not seeing things clearly. 
maybe I'm a little upside down. Maybe I need to be open to what God is saying to me. And that sounds, might might sound strange to you, but to put yourself in a posture that says, God, I'm not, I'm going to let go. I'm not going to hold on to the things. I'm going to really listen to you. And I'm actually going to do what you're telling me to do. And in order to do that, I have to actually listen. So anyone in here a good listener? I know now you're afraid to raise your hand, right? You're like, I'm not, I'm terrible. Uh, But some of you might think, I'm a pretty good listener. I'm pretty decent. Yeah, most of you probably think you're a pretty good driver, but I've seen you drive, and I, you, some of you have driven with me, I know, but, but we know it's not true, okay? So we think we're good listeners because why? Because we can hear. Well, most of us, I think most of us can, can hear a little bit. Most of us can see too, but why is it that we miss some things in plain sight? I have a video I want to show you, and we're going to roll it right now, and I want you just to do what it asks you to do. Well, go ahead. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But Did you see the moonwalking bear? before and you were ready. You're like, oh, I've seen it. I've seen it before. I know I know. I got to look for something else, right? But others completely missed the moonwalking bear. Uh, why? And you're, you're not, it's not abnormal. A lot of people miss it. But why? Well, maybe, maybe because we're not maybe as observant as we think we are, or that maybe we just missed it. We're not calibrated to see it. I think the same is true when it comes to listening in general. Like you might be a good listener, you think, but maybe sometimes you just miss it. So while I was away, I had time time to explore lots of passages, and this is the one of the passages that stood out to me. And I was always so focused on the parable that Jesus was teaching, and I love this parable. And I love that later on he breaks it down because I feel like this is so applicable to every single person in the world. But what I missed when I would read this chapter is the part that Jesus says afterward. Okay, so I'm going to read Matthew 13, 1 through 9. So you can follow me along on the screen. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. It says this, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. So you see that imagery? Got that picture? Then... He told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell along the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up and the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root, Others' seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still others fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was shown. Like I said, there's so much in this text. Jesus is describing four different soils, and when he describes parables, usually parables are told so that you can find a person could find themselves in that story. So he's telling them a bigger thing. But I want us to focus on what he says right after that in verse 9. He says, whoever has ears, let them hear. How many of you have ears? Okay, all right, good. Okay, good. All right. It's okay if you don't. But um, most of us, you know, how many of you are hard of hearing? I am. I am. Okay. How many of you stopped listening to me, listening to me about two minutes ago? Okay. I, Jessica and I have gotten to the age where we pretty much 
put subtitles on at our home all the time. And we say it's not because we can't hear as well, which I totally know it's why, um, for me at least. But, you know, when actors have accents, it's kind of hard to understand what they're saying. And so we want to see the words. Now, if this annoys you like it did me for many, many years when I would see subtitles on the screen, I'm like, why are they doing that? Um, blocking the picture. The truth is we, we want to see the words so that we can understand it. And even there's times where I read the words and I'm hearing it and I don't understand it. So I have to rewind it like one more time, one more time, one more time. What do you say? What? What? I don't get it. Our desire is, is to hear and to listen and then finally understand. But in this passage, Jesus is alluding to something more than that. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Jesus knows that, that they all have ears. He's not asking if you physically have these ears. What he's asking if, is if anyone might have ears to hear what I'm saying, what I'm truly saying, what I truly want you to know here all the way down in here. And so he goes on to reference the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. And it says this in Matthew 13, 13b through 15. And this is where I want to camp out for a minute. He goes on and says, Those seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. So Jesus is recapping the call of the prophet Isaiah into ministry as a prophet to God's people. And Isaiah says, here I am, send me, you know, like, I'm ready, I'm ready for this. And God's like, okay, this, you know, they're not going to see or hear or understand you. They're going to be, their, their hearts have grown callous, dull, dark, and dead. So have at it, go. And as I was sitting there in, in this passage, God, God began the process uh, of cracking open my, my eyes and ears. You know when your ears pop and they kind of readjust and when your heart kind of is open to something different. I remember asking the question like, who is God talking about here? Like, it's got to be somebody else. Eyes shut, unable to listen, heart callous. He, is he, wait, no. He's not talking about me. So I want to break this passage down. I'm going to look at verse 14 and 15, and I'm going to look at four parts. And I just want you to follow with me. So we're going to look at verse 14, and it says this, part one. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. My, my son was playing uh, the, something on the piano the other day, and he was also asking me a question, because we were kind of in conversation, but then I kind of like jumped out of the conversation, and I was on my phone reading something, and I meant to, I will go to say something to Jessica, and we're all kind of sitting in the living room, and, uh, and, and I didn't really hear him say anything, and Jessica goes, uh, you know, were you, were, did you hear what he said? Are you listening to him? And I was like, of course I was. I mean, I... I <laughs> yes, I heard him. And then uh, Silas goes, all right, well, then what did I say? And, and I was like, dang it, they're like teaming up on me now. And it just used to be one of them. Now it's both of them. But, but the point being is this. We, we have ears, but sometimes we're not really listening or we're just missing it. So if you could start there for just a second, that might actually begin the rotation of us from upside down to right side up. Maybe just begin it. If you've been married for any period of time, you're familiar um, probably with this. If, if you ever ask your spouse if everything's okay and, and you get the word fine, no, it's fine. Um, don't make that mistake, young man. Uh, I, <laughs> she is not, she's not only not fine, um, you will not even be remotely fine in a minute if you don't wake up and realize that you are not understanding. You might be hearing, but you are not understanding. Those two go hand in hand. And that's true of every, every relationship, especially the one 
with our Father. Part two, you will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Who in here wears glasses? I can see some of you, but some of you wear contacts, right, too, right? You wear contacts? Cool. All right, I'm going to take a wild guess that there are some of you who wear glasses or contact lenses, um, and you need to update that prescription, okay? I'm going to guess there's probably a few of you in here that need to update that prescription, but you just haven't had the time, right? It's just, it's life's busy, and you know, I don't, I don't want to instantly improve my vision. Like, I just don't have time for that, right? It's strange, Why do people do this? Well, because either we're just like super busy, tired, or for some of us, maybe we've just grown complacent and settled for the partial or even diminished vision and sight that we have right now. The passage says, ever seeing but never perceiving. I'm going to guess that some of us have pretty good vision in here. Some of us even have the vision to see other people's stuff. And you go, oh, I know how to fix their life. I know what they need to do. And I know what, I know what needs to change. You know, you're saying, see, what you need to do is, or what, if you just stop doing whatever, X, Y, and Z, some of us are really even good at seeing how other people need Jesus, right? We're just like, oh, so-and-so needs to hear this message. Oh, so-and-so needs to hear this, right? Like, they need a relationship with God. They need to go to church. They, they, you know, they, need, to, they need community. They need connection. They need a small group, which might be true. I mean, I'm going to say it's probably 100% true. But what about you? See, I'm so good at seeing other people's needs. But what about my own need? Am I perceiving? Am, am I recognizing my desperate need for Jesus? Or am I just going through my routine? Going through the motions and not truly recognizing that I cannot experience the life that Jesus offers if I don't first recognize I need him every single day. Part three, it says this, for this people's heart has become calloused. When we think of growth, we think of progress. We think of development. We think of advancement. You know what we don't think of? We don't think of decline. We don't think of wasting away. For those that are older, you know what this feeling is like. As strong as you might have been, as quick as you might have been, maybe as spry as you used to be, there is a slowing down. And I've been feeling that for years. I mean, I keep, my body is telling me to stop running, like stop doing those things that you shouldn't be doing. I pulled my hamstring the other day because I'm like, I thought I was 20. You know, I'm like, I'm an idiot. Uh, but, but do you know that what's even worse than the physical decline is when you experience the decline of your heart. And I don't mean the physical part of your heart. I don't mean the slowing down of blood flow. I don't mean heart palpitations. I mean your heart grows in such a way that it doesn't love maybe like the, it used to. It doesn't care or doesn't desire or doesn't yearn, or doesn't long for the things that God created it for like it used to. See, calluses are really, really easy to see on the hands. You can feel it when you shake someone's hand. You can feel the calluses in another person. But a callous heart can go undetected. And before long, there's this barrier that no longer feels or experiences the connection that was once there. This was an area God was working on in me. And again, it's easy to notice it in other people, but I believe God was going, listen, son, listen. There's some areas that this applies to you, applies to your heart. Part four, they hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes, okay? We established that. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Here's, here's kind of where I want to land this plane. I'm going to ask the worship team to kind of join me here. Uh, it's one thing to acknowledge that we haven't been hearing like we should or seeing like we should be seeing. But God is saying in this passage, if we can come to the point where we stop pointing 
at others who need to hear and, and see and admit that maybe we're the one. Maybe I'm the one that needs the adjustment in hearing and seeing. And maybe if, I, if we could come to terms with that reality, then maybe our hearts would turn and maybe God would heal them. See, that's actually the promise of this passage. This is the promise that Jesus is saying. Hearts that are turned towards God, resulting in healing and restoration. But hearts don't turn unless they see and hear. That has to happen first. I spent so much time, and even the last few months, pondering many things that I, that I can't unpack with all of you here today. But I can share the heart of what was most influential for me during this time. See, many of like, if you, just like me, are, are flying upside down. And you're, and you're in the air, and you're in control, and you're experiencing the highs, and you're experiencing the lows. That's okay. And, and that we, just, we just call it life, right? That's just life. But we're turned in such a way that seems right to you. But in reality, it is upside down. We want healing, but we're trying to figure it out by our, all by ourselves. We, we, we don't want help. We might, we might even sing a song about God's hope and healing, right? But we're still very much in the driver's seat. We're still piloting the plane that's turned the wrong way. And what we need is a recalibration. What we need is for someone to get through to us, to tell us that we're turned the wrong way. We're not oriented well to continue flying and experiencing all that God wants us to experience. So here I am telling you. But I'm not telling you because you can just get a hold of it, right? Grip on and just take it over. Like, this is what we need to do. Go the right way. Turn it upside down. No, I'm trying to tell you that you need to let go of it. You need to open up your hands that maybe have grown a little bit calloused from gripping that steering wheel too tight. And let God begin to slowly change and turn you right side up to begin the healing process. Allow God to shower you with his love and with his goodness and with his grace to be reminded of who you are and who you're, that you're so much more than what you do. That your identity is not found in, in people. It's not found in a relationship. It's not found in anything that you even say, but it's purely found in the fact that God calls you son and daughter. That is who you are. See, we're entering into a new season of our church's life something very exciting, and I'm so grateful and thankful to be a part of it. But if my eyes and, and my ears are closed off, if they're out of tune or if they're even calloused, will I be able to actually experience what God wants me to experience? Will we as a church experience what God wants us to experience? Which, will I know which way is up? See, God's mission hasn't changed, and it's not going to change. We're set on making it a place where you can, you can meet God regardless of where you are. He will meet you right where you are. If you're okay, if you're not okay, if you, if you have things together, or if you're trying to pretend like you have things together. If you've been a part of a church for a very long time, or if you're just brand new and you've never been a part of a church. The point of all that is that I want you to realize that God has always been pursuing you. He's always been making a way. He's always been drawing near to you. And maybe we just haven't noticed it. Maybe we, 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 we want to experience this real life that God has and we see other people having it and we feel like the emptiness sometimes or we feel calloused or we don't feel what everyone else is feeling. I mean, there's an excitement, there's an exciting thing coming together as, as a church, a, a family and, and, and seeing what the body of Christ can do in a community for the kingdom of God, for the greater good but maybe we don't feel what everybody else is feeling. And that's okay. God will meet you right where you are. That's okay. I've been following Jesus for about 25 years now. And I can say that the same thing today, as I said 25 years ago, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be able to hear the things that I am able to hear now. I wouldn't be able to see the things that God sees. I wouldn't be able to, to love my heart wouldn't be oriented in the right way. I wouldn't be able to have the compassion or the empathy or the understanding. And I don't get it right every time. And sometimes I take over. 
Like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm tired of being compassionate. Oh, I'm tired of empathizing. Oh, I'm tired of certain things. But then I, I'm reminded of, oh man, God, God's goodness to me. God's goodness to me has been so much that I, why, why do I keep trying to fight that? I just need to let him continue to heal me and turn me right side up. That's what the love of God has done for me. That's what he did for me in my sabbatical time, but that's what he's been doing me for 25 years. In fact, I would argue he's been doing that for much longer than that. And so I'm going to ask you guys to stand. I think that we are in need of healing at some level, and I don't know where you are. I don't know who, I may, I may not even know you, but I know that there's parts of our life that feel like this, and we so want to be right side up. And so... As we, as we worship and sing this last song, God has made a way. God has made a way possible. And if you don't have the words to muster up the feeling, then let the word speak to you. Maybe it needs to be a blessing over your life. Maybe this is the blessing that God wants you to hear today. So let's sing. Let's worship.